The Ukrainian forces recently restored some positions in the area of Sevesk and Pokrovsk in the Donetsk region, and the armed forces of Ukraine are also continuing their operation in the Kursk region. However, the Russian occupiers had minor success near Pokrovsk, as well as Kurokovo and Kremenaya. This is stated in a report by the Institute for the Study of War. According to analysts, fighting continued in the main Ukrainian bridgehead in the Kursk region on November the 9th, but there was no confirmed progress in this area by either side. A Russian blogger with ties to the Kremlin claimed that the Ukrainian armed forces are using unknown tanks during the assault on Russian positions in the Kursk region. ISW analysts add that the armed forces of Ukraine recently regained lost positions north of Belohorivka. At the same time, Russian forces carried out offensive operations in the area of Verknekamenskoy, east of Siversk and Belohorivka on November the 8th and 9th. The ISW report indicates that both Ukrainian and Russian forces have advanced in the area of Pokrovsk. Based on geolocated imagery on October the 31st and November the 9th, analysts determined that the Ukrainian armed forces have regained control over lost positions north of Novorodivka, located southeast of the district center. At the same time, citing additional footage, ISW notes that the occupation army has advanced along the E-50 Donetsk-Pokrovsk highway north of Selidov. Russian troops also carried out offensive operations to the north of Kurokov in the area of Ilinka, Novoselidivka, Novodmitrivka, Beretsky and Voznesenka in the east, near Maximilianivka in the south, in the vicinity of Dalny. Even in the early phase of the 21st century Battle of Kursk, the Ukrainians have demonstrated that they have learned the hard lessons of last year's failed counter-offensive. Their preparations had been meticulous. The Ukraine preserved operational security, denying the Russians crucial information about where it might strike and with what strength. Importantly, using a defensive operation in Sumy as a cover story, they denied the Russians the knowledge that Ukrainian offensive operations were even under consideration. Ukraine also used very experienced formations for the initial phases of the operation. Unlike in their 2023 counteroffensive, they maximized the use of drones and snuffed out the Russian drone forces across a huge swathe of Kursk in the lead up to and in the early hours of their operation. This denied Russia crucial and timely intelligence. The Kremlin will step up its aggression against Ukraine in the coming months, including resuming strikes on energy infrastructure facilities and may also attempt to assassinate the Ukrainian leadership. This statement was made by the former head of the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry, Vadim Pristaiko, whose words are quoted by The Economist. They will try to do something. They will destroy the energy system. They will try to kill the leadership, the former minister said. In his opinion, the next three months will be terrible. Increasing aggression may be a way of negotiating for Russian dictator Vladimir Putin after Donald Trump was elected U.S. president. The publication writes that Trump may be impressed by Putin's style of governance and Ukrainian leader Volodymyr Zelensky may face two possible outcomes, defeat or dead end, since it is unclear how exactly the U.S. president-elect intends to fulfill his promise to quickly end the war in Ukraine given during the election campaign. Journalists admit that even Trump himself may not know what his plan is. The article states that the Ukrainian authorities are working with two options for ending the war voiced by Trump's entourage. The first option is to freeze the war along the current front lines and force Kiev into neutrality. It was voiced by J.D. Vance, whom Trump wants to be his vice president. The second option was voiced by Mike Pompeo, who served as Secretary of State during Trump's first term. This option, as the publication notes, suits Kiev better since it provides for increased military and financial assistance to Ukraine to contain the Kremlin's aggressive intentions and also preserves the prospect of the Ukrainian state joining NATO. Meanwhile, Bloomberg writes, Trump made it clear that he cannot simply push Ukraine to make concessions to Putin without receiving anything in return. The Guardian writes that Trump's rise to power is unpredictable. It is impossible to predict with certainty how the Republican will behave on the issue of the war between Kiev and Moscow. Judging by his previous statements, he may force the warring countries to the negotiating table. There are four points 
that Russian dictator Vladimir Putin will likely present to Ukraine and Trump as conditions for ending the war. This is the result he can present to his own population as a victory. The Guardian recalled that back in 2022, Putin had already appropriated four Ukrainian regions and Crimea on paper, including those territories that his army did not control. He will probably insist that Ukraine give them back to him, including the regional centers of Kherson and Zaporizhia. Another requirement could be the so-called buffer zone. This is the withdrawal by Ukraine of serious weapons from the borders of the Russian Federation and the occupied territories. The third condition is reparations for the destruction of the occupied Donbass. And the last thing in Ukraine's refusal to join NATO and return to neutral status. All this would be unacceptable for Kiev and the majority of Ukrainians, the article says. The Experimentation and Trials Group of the British Army recently conducted tests of the ground-based kamikaze drone intended for tank destruction at the Salisbury Plain training area. The Defence Express reported this. It is noted that one company from the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Yorkshire Regiment participated in the tests according to Army recognition. The tests involved the Russian T-80 BVM tank, likely in an incomplete state, as the target for the ground-based anti-tank drone. There are limited sources where the British military could acquire the Russian T-80 BVM, likely in a damaged or incomplete state, for testing. A more intriguing question is what the British may have exchanged to obtain this captured tank. Returning to the ground-based anti-tank drone tested by the British Trials Group, it's notable that details on this specific development are limited adding to the interest surrounding it. It is reported that the ground-based kamikaze drone is capable of moving across various terrain types with both remote control and autonomous navigation available for guiding it to its target. The amount of explosives this device can carry has not been disclosed. Furthermore, the British Army emphasizes that this stage is primarily a technology demonstration intended to assess integration methods for tanks and ground drones on the battlefield. Based on these findings, they will later consider procurement of specific remotely operated systems. Defense Express notes the significance of this systematic approach. Although reports have indicated that Ukrainian defenders have used ground kamikaze drones against Russian forces, the British military aims to systemize the use of these drones as anti-tank weapons. Such a structured approach could be instrumental in enhancing the Ukrainian armed forces' capabilities. The Russian T-80 tank, a heavily used asset in the Ukrainian conflict, is a descendant of the T-64, a Cold War-era tank. Initially impressive with its advanced features and mobility, the T-80 has shown significant vulnerabilities in the current war. Tanks are ideal in theory for sweeping across geography like the plains of Eastern Europe to secure more territory. But Russia's use of its tank forces has not gone especially well. Thousands upon thousands of tanks have been destroyed. Many of these are outdated Cold War-era tanks inherited from the Soviet Union, like the T-80 main battle tank, which Russia has deployed heavily. Thousands of T-80 tanks were produced before the Soviet Union collapsed, 4,839 to be exact. Russia still possesses the majority, but Ukraine absorbed their fair share of T-80s too. The T-80 did not see much action until recently. During the Russo-Ukrainian war, both sides have relied on tank warfare generally and the T-80 specifically. The Russians have already lost hundreds of T-80 tanks since the war began.